Well, good morning, everyone. I'm here by a series of providences. Usually Ken gives me at least 45 minutes prep. He gave me a whole week this week, so we're good. We've been studying the book of Titus, and we've been looking at the attributes or characteristics or qualities or qualifications of what it means to be an elder or a pastor. And it seems that um, we think about the qualities, but we don't necessarily think about the life that follows along with, I have those qualities, now I have to live that life. And this morning, that's what we're going to be taking up, is the minister's life, and I subtitle it, The Hope of Glory. And in Paul's letter to Timothy, he um, expands the list that we were looking at in Titus. In all, there are 24 items listed. I run out of fingers and toes when I have to count that high. So can I get, a, you know, I can only get 20 of them. But God says there's a, there's a long list. There's a lot of stuff that is required of a minister. And in light of the fact that we have just are kicking off here in September, our Entrust Leadership Academy and our Entrust Bible Institute, which is training leaders, pastors, elders for the future. So we now have three promises. Ken can't be here. We're talking about elders. We're talking about leaders. So you know what we have to talk about today? What it means to be a minister. And we're going to look this morning at the life of Paul. Sometimes you go, well, isn't Paul Mr. Super Christian? Now, he is kind of an elder's elder, but the pattern of his life unholds. And if we've looked through church history, you can see the pattern of his life is repeated over millennia and in many, many lives. And so I think that we can be safe ground that what Paul dealt with, maybe in scope, maybe in magnitude, maybe a little different than what a minister today would be, but I could also say in other parts of the world it's pretty much the same. So we're going to see there's some challenges that come along with it. And if you were at our uh, Fire International um, fellowship back in May, you got to hear men who have been in ministry 20, 30, 40 years describe and talk about what it really means to be in ministry. And I remember one of, my, my, one of the guys I, I love just said, I was quaking in my boots. I was scared to death. I was terrified after 35 years of ministry how weak I was. And so don't ever think that a minister is some kind of superman. Paul was not some kind of superman. We're going to see exactly what it means to be a minister this morning. And if you have not got a chance to listen to those messages, uh, I highly commend them to you, especially young men who are looking to be ministers. It might scare you off. Maybe you'll be scared by the end of this sermon. I am. I'm scared given it. Because it is a responsibility before the Lord and for his people that not many should even want. And we will see that. And I want to ask our blessing upon this time because this is very important to the life of this church and God gave me no other message to be able to bring. So let's ask his blessing upon it, not mine because you don't want to hear my words. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for all that you do and how you lead men to lead your flock but in a way such that it honors you that you are the one who gains the glory, not us. And we just thank you for the, the flock, for the encouragement, for the strength, for the comfort that you give. And Father, as we look at the life of a minister this morning, we just pray that we might be those who honor you in all things, that we are able to com present each and every man, woman, and child here complete in Christ, in your Son. For that is the purpose that we strive. And we just again ask your blessing upon this and let your words be heard and not the mere 
earthen vessel that is presenting it. Amen. If you already had your fingers in Colossians, Greg read a wonderful text, and that was all the lead up. So we're going to continue in Colossians chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 24 through 29. And as I said, we're going to be looking at the life of a minister or a minister's life, the hope of glory. And for our outline this morning, we're going to look at the joy and the suffering of a minister. We're going to look at the calling and message of a minister. We're going to look at the work and the purpose of a minister. And we're going to look at the labor of a minister. So I'm going to begin, I'm going to read Colossians 1.24. I'm just going to take this a piece at a time. So we're going to look at first the joy and the suffering of a minister. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction. And Paul has transitioning here, as Greg has already read this morning, he's transitioning from the wonderful, amazing thing, the fullness, the completeness that he is praying for those in Colossae, the believers, and what the work of Christ has done. And he says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And we don't obviously think of joy and suffering and rejoicing and suffering going together. So how do we put those two things together? First thing, easy observation. He doesn't say, I rejoice at my sufferings. There's a big difference. He's not going, woo, I'm suffering. Okay, if you're doing that, you've missed the whole point. He rejoices in his sufferings. They're guaranteed. So we know that's going to happen. Christ has promised us that as believers. And as a minister, you will suffer. It's not health, wealth, and prosperity, I'm sorry. But we can rejoice in our sufferings. James says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And if you notice here, he says, Consider it all joy. It doesn't say, Feel it all joy. Get excited about it that it's all joy. Consider it all joy. That means when you're suffering, when you're going through those difficult times, it requires us to have our proper focus. Our minds need to be transformed and renewed in how we consider when we suffer. Because he says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And that's another thing about suffering. Endurance does not mean short. As many of you know, there's the difference between chronic pain, short, and acute, or acute pain, sorry, got it backwards, acute pain, short, and chronic pain, lasting. One you can deal with shortly, the other one requires endurance. And he says, you have to understand that when you have these trials, there is going to be suffering that you have to consider and know that God is working in it. The writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 12, 11 says, all discipline, because he's talking about God disciplining those whom he loves, all discipline for the moment seems not joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, if you notice, training, afterwards yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Again, he says, I can rejoice in my suffering. But it's not just about him. Notice the next phrase. For your sake. He's not saying for my sake. These other passages, he is going to profit and benefit from it, just like all of us. But he says, it is for your sake that I rejoice in my suffering. And that's a hard thing. To realize that as a minister, you will suffer for the sake of others. Didn't Christ do that for us? And we're going to see that great blessing 
that's going to come because this is the suffering part, but there's also the rejoicing part. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 15 through 18, Paul reiterates this idea of suffering for the sake of others. All the things that he talks about prior to this, he says, For all things are for your sake, so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause to give the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. So if you notice, all these things are to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. But though the outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. If you notice here, Paul's writings, especially in Corinthians, he uses a plural. We. Again, he doesn't say I. Have you ever thought about this? The apostle Paul is dealing with difficulty, and he's dealing it within a we. He has others around him, and we're going to see later that, that even with that, he is tested beyond his strength. They are all tested beyond their strength. And he says, for this momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison. As we've been singing that great crowns that we get to throw before God's feet, the 10,000 reasons we can sing. He says, it's producing an eternal weight of of glory beyond all comparison is your mind already starting to shift to say what does it mean to be in ministry it's a completely different thinking pattern it's a completely different way and that's what we all should be thinking not just those who are in ministry for while we while we look at while we look not at things which are seen but things which are not seen for the things which are seen are temporal in other words they're time-bound, they're going to be over. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Again, his thinking, his consideration, his understanding, he therefore can rejoice in his sufferings for the sake of others. And you wonder sometimes what those momentary light afflictions were. In the same letter, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 Verses 23 through 29, Paul explains a little bit more about that. He's having to defend his apostleship here, but it says, Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. I more so. In far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beatings without number, often in danger of death. If we just stopped right there, how many want to be a minister? I, I want to quit right there. Because... I mean, we don't even think about those things today. There are ministers in this world who do think about these every day. Now, he goes on to explain what that looks like. Five times I received 39 lashes from the Jews. The sentence of 40 lashes was considered death. Five times 39. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and the day I was spent in the deep. I've been on journeys, I've been on frequent journeys, in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea. Okay, what's where's safe? I'm in Christ. Wow. There's no place safe on this planet. And the worst one, dangers among false brethren. You ever thought about that? Ken's already mentioned that in talking about Titus, you realize this in this room, there are false brethren. There are false teachers. There are wolves. There are tares amongst the wheat. They're the hardest ones because they're hard to spot. Jude says they sneak into your love feast unnoticed. Can you imagine that betrayal that came to Paul? But guess what? The Lord was also betrayed. That would be the hardest thing as a minister the flock that you're caring about bites you because you find out there's a wolf. I've been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights and hunger and thirst without food, in cold and exposure. But see, here's the difference. All of us can experience all those things, can't we? But here's the difference of a minister. And gentlemen, if you're looking to be a minister, here's what's going to be the real weight on you. Apart from such external things, by the way, remember he's already called these light momentary afflictions. 
Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure upon me of concern for all the churches. Paul had all the churches. A minister has the flock that God has granted to oversee. And he says, who is weak without me being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? I can tell you, by sitting amongst our elders, that is our concern, that is our weight, that is our burden. Money, who cares? We have a father with a cattle on a thousand hills. A place to meet. God can put us out in the trees. We don't care. But the concern of people that are hurting, marriages that are breaking, people without jobs, medical situations, people falling into sin, pride, arrogance, all those things, that is the weight that a minister carries. And we all carry that to a certain extent, don't we, for our home and our family. But see, a minister has to carry this for a church. And I can tell you, we are very careful with one another to try to protect each other from that weight. Because how many weights can you carry before you're crushed? How many weights can you carry? And see, this is the burden. But God also gives us great comfort. Because in 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 10, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comforts which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. And our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as sharers of our suffering, so you also shall be sharers of our comfort. You understand that affliction is necessary so that we can comfort others as God comforts us. So every single tear, every single trial, every single thing God does in our lives that is, brings about suffering, he also says, I bring comfort. And we, as the body of Christ, can comfort one another through those things. If you've ever been through a trial and God has gotten you through that, you have a ministry. You have a ministry. Because somebody else out here, somebody you come across is going to need that comfort. And you can help them and say, God has got me through that. There is no doubt. And we have comforts here galore. I just about, I mean, knowing the people in this congregation, there are people who have suffered almost everything imaginable. They can comfort you. That's why we need the body. You understand ministers can't carry all that weight. We can't. We need each other. And yet, we have that comfort that God gives us. We are sharers in suffering. We are sharers in comfort. Together. In Christ. So, what burdens are we all willing to bear? What difficulties and trials to help and encourage one another? Because there are people that are hurting probably sitting right next to you. You ought to ask them, are you hurting today? Let me comfort you if I can. If nothing else, I can pray for you. Because I have the God of all comfort. Know my God. Now, I would be remiss, because some of you who are theologians are sitting here going, and what about that lacking of Christ's sufferings that Paul's filling up? He says, I, in my flesh, I share on my behalf, his, on behalf of his body, which is his church, and filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction. Well, just be real careful. This is not about affliction, about the, the cross was insufficient. This is not works. This is nothing you need to do. Because as we've read in 1 Corinthians, or in 2 Corinthians um, 
1, 5. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also are the comfort abundant through Christ. That's what this abundance is. This is the affliction. And it basically, the way you would translate this is, I am taking my turn in sharing that burden. The afflictions that would have come to Christ, but he's not here. We are here. I share. It's my turn. Now it's our turn. Paul's gone 2,000 years ago. It's our turn. I am going to be here as if Christ was here. So, joy and suffering. But what about the calling and message of a minister? This is verses 25 through 27. Of this church, these people, these ones who I am suffering for, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed upon me for your benefit, so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God, that is the mystery which has been hidden from ages and past ages and generations, but now has been manifested to his saints, to whom God has willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And when Paul says that he was made a minister, I want us to make a couple of observations about this. That word minister, we always think, okay, that means I'm, I'm, I'm a preacher. That, that word's actually the same word for house servant. He says, I was made a house servant by the stewardship of God. In other words, God has given me a stewardship, a responsibility. A house steward or a house servant was to be responsible for their master's household. They weren't in charge to be in charge. They weren't in charge because they were so great. But they were ones that their master entrusted to be responsible for their property and for the lives of all of the people in the household. Think about that responsibility. That's what Paul says he is. And he says, I was made that. I was given that. Because it was bestowed upon me by God. I didn't take it. And I want to I point out a little, maybe it's, maybe it's obvious, maybe it's not obvious, but it kind of struck me. We're talking about men desiring to be elders. And in 1 Timothy 3, 1, it says, It is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. We all should be looking into being those quality of people. But if you notice here, it doesn't say, therefore you will be one. See, being a minister is a calling of God. It is a bestowal by God, as Paul said. God bestowed this upon me. And all of you who have been in the church history class should realize how many godly men literally, and I'm not making this up, literally got up out of their places of residence, wherever it was, and ran to get away from people making them to be elders. They weren't seeking it. They didn't want it. God said, you're an elder. So that was very clear. Think about Paul. Paul was wanting to be an elder, didn't he? As he was going on the road to Damascus. Hi, let me be a minister of God's church. Oh, I'm going to kill them first and you know, I'll let you sort them out, right? No. God said, I was, Paul says, I was made one. He was smart. He knew the Bible. He knew the scriptures. And yet, even then, Paul was called out and he was told, oh, by the way, all the sufferings that you're going to have to do. And after that, what did he do? Three years of training after being a guy who was trained under Gamaliel, the best teacher in all of Judaism. He was trained. He worked. And then he still needed three more years. And then did he go off and say, hey, I'm in charge? He went, no, I'm going to go back to Jerusalem. I'm going to talk with the, the apostles. And then he goes back to Tarsus. And then eventually, probably six to nine years later, he ends up in Antioch and he's ministering there. Hey, and Paul wanted to be a missionary. No, wait a second. It was the Holy Spirit who said, call for me, Paul and Barnabas, and I'll send them out. If you notice here, 
Paul's not chasing after anything, and yet he was already told this is what he needs to do. He was training. He was working. Do you understand how afraid people were of the Apostle Paul? He had to earn their trust. He had to earn their respect. He had to serve and minister for quite a long time. And God says, okay, now's the time. So a minister has to be a house steward, has to be responsible for God's people. It's bestowed upon them. And this is kind of like, so we've been teaching through the canonization of the Bible. God's authority in His Word is God's authority in His Word. How we get the Bible is we actually recognize it. That's the difference. If God calls out a man, our job is to recognize it. Not to force it. So look around and start recognizing what you see as men that God have called. And men, don't force it. Desire it, but let God bestow it. And see, Paul clearly demonstrated passion, and that's a drive, not necessarily an emotion. Ability, character, faithfulness. He just didn't get excited and say, wow, I want to be a missionary. Great. Now are you ready to work and labor and strive and be ready and be trusted and be bestowed upon by God? So what was his message? And I'm not going to go into details on this because Ken has already covered this very well. That he might carry out fully the preaching of the word of God. He's preaching Christ. So what does, he spo- what does he say at the end of this? Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He equates those two ideas. Christ in you and the hope of glory are the same things. Without Christ in you, there is no hope of glory. That is his message. That is what he is to proclaim, to fully carry out. And as we we read earlier, did you see all of the things, the fullness and the completeness of what Paul wanted these men to be? In Ephesians 3, he gives a little bit more detail on it. He says, he's talking about this mystery that has been revealed, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and are partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, which again, I was made minister according to the, will, to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to his power. Unless you're Jewish in here, <laughs> this is that wonderful mystery that we get to hear. The grace of God, the promises in Christ that we get to be partakers of. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Isn't it amazing? So let's look real briefly at the work and purpose of a minister. Verse 28. We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. So look at the work. Proclaiming Him, the hope of glory, the one who transfers from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, and on and on and on and on. The one to be worshipped, the one who is worthy, the one who is glorious, the one who is Savior, the one who is Lord. And we can go on for an hour describing the magnificent hymn we proclaim. And there's two things that come along with this. The first one is way harder than it sounds. Admonishing every man or every woman or every child. That means to correct 2 Timothy 3.16 talks about the profitability of teaching for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Reproof says, that's wrong. Correction says, that's right. Training in righteousness says, and this is the way you walk that right path. The hard part is, is how many of us are walking the wrong path, even if we know what the right path is. That's that correction. And it's way 
harder than it looks. We love you guys. And how many of us like to be told we're walking down the wrong path? I don't. But are we faithful if we don't? He says, this is your task. Proclaim him, admonishing everyone. We'll talk about this in a second more. And the other side is teaching everyone. The full, whole counsel of God. The counsel of truth. From Genesis to Revelation and everything in between. I don't know about you, but I've been a believer, gosh, 50 years now? Praise God for that. And now the older I get, the more I know I have to learn. And sadly, the more I've forgotten. I'm blaming it on the gray hair. Uh, it's a memory lapse. The more you know, the more you know how great our God is. And the, how little you really know about Him. And so as we teach and as we learn and as we grow, we have to always have that attitude. And it's too easy, though, to fall off the side on either direction on admonishing or teaching. I'm going to admonish you. I'm going to go around and be the thought police on everything you did and say. Wham, 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 wham. Right? Been in churches that way? Been there, seen it, done it? Not proud of it? Or you fall off the other end. Oh, I just love you guys so much. God will, God will work it out. And you say nothing. Same thing with teaching. Can bring the truth. We're going to keep it simple because we don't want to confuse you. Or I could teach this lesson in Greek and confuse you. Right? What is the thing that is required for admonishment and teaching? With all wisdom. That is the hard part. That is the difficult part. How do we admonish and teach with wisdom? It's not just truth, it's truth in love. It's not just picking up a baseball bat and somebody saying wrong, 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 or ignoring it. Each and every person. That means you got to be smelly like the sheep. You got to know them. You got to know where they are. You got to know who they are. You can't just stand back in an ivory tower and say, hey, I'm God's gift to God. Oh, wait a second. That's not a household servant who's responsible been given a stewardship, is it? Proclaim him, admonishing and teaching with all wisdom. And what is the purpose of this? To, to present every man complete in Christ. And Paul talked about how complete that looks in the first part of this book. And he's going to continue on as he presses on through the rest of this book. We, we, we actually put some reminders in this building to remind us of that. If you get a chance, go and observe the banners. As you walk in the building, it says, be ready in season and out of season to preach the word. As you come around, and what do we preach? We preach Christ and him crucified. Why do we do it? To present every man complete in Christ. So therefore, we will have worshipers so we can enter his courts with praise. And over here, we have the banner, abide in me and I in you, because that's the only place we can be, him and us. And that's going to rotate out, and it's going to remind us reaching out to the world. It's going to remind us of God with us. It's going to remind us that there's only salvation found in the God, and it's, he is the resurrection and life, and then it rotates back to here. Look at it. Ponder upon it. It's not just pretty banners to remind us what we're about, why we do what we do. They are pretty. John did a great job. So let's look lastly at the labor of a minister. For this purpose I also labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. And this word... For this purpose, that means here's why I do it. Here's how I do it. Labor. That means to grow weary with toil. And it was very much used in that time of an athlete or a soldier. I think the closing ceremonies of the Olympics are today. How much 
labor do you think those athletes put into their work to win a gold medal? We have crowns to throw down before our great God and King. What more labor should we have? It's labor. It's striving. It's that kind of image that's being used here. Striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. That word strive is where we get the word agonize. It's not just hanging out. It's not just dealing with the buds, but that's okay. Fellowship's a good thing. Getting to know people's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with it. But there is an effort beyond labor to the point of I am really pushing myself. Again, used of athletes and soldiers. But, notice the flip side of it. Striving according to His power, which mightily works within me. Paul never said, I labor and I agonize because I can do it. Matter of fact, he knows he can't. He can't do it. And any man, woman, or child here who believes that they can do it, you're already lost. The battle's over with. It isn't going to happen. Because let me explain to you how Paul saw his life. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7, he says, and after talking about the wonderful message that he gets to send out, he says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power of God and not of ourselves. Have you ever asked, God, I can't take it anymore. It's pushing me beyond what I am able to endure. And his answer is, good. What kind of faith do you have when you can handle it? Paul recognized that he was pushed beyond what he could do because he had to rely on God. And what a wonderful, amazing thing to say, Christ in me, the hope of glory. And look at what he said. Here's, here's what it looks like. We are afflicted in every way. Dangers in this and dangers in that and dangers everywhere. I'm afflicted. But what does he say? Not crushed. He's going to get back up. Perplexed. Have you ever been perplexed? That means Paul and all of his companions said, we don't get it. God, what are you doing? But we're not despairing because we know you have a plan. Persecuted. We're not just talking about afflicted. We're talking about people outright going after them. Some of you may have had that experience. But not forsaken because God is always with us walking through this. Struck down. That's like taking a punch down to the mat. Struck down but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of Christ. Why? So that the life of Christ may be manifested in our body. When we're struck down, when we feel these things, God says, let me show you the power I have. Let others see that. When they look at you and say, how can you endure that? My God, my Lord, my Savior. And young men, if you're going to be a minister, get used to this. Believer, get used to this. And yet we have that power of God that mightily works within us. So the life of a minister is the hope of glory. It involves suffering and joy. It's difficult, and yet there's great comfort in it. It's a calling, not just a desire. The message we have is Christ. The task we have requires admonishment and teaching with all wisdom to make sure everybody knows and looks like our Lord to be complete, to be fulfilled in Christ. 
it is going to require agonizing labor. Not floating through, blowing things off. It's hard, hard work. It is going to be full of weakness and yet powered by God. So I ask, who is adequate for these things? I know I'm not. Only our Lord is. And that's where we have to turn. Let's pray. Father, we know we are so limited. We know that you know so much more than we do. We are perplexed sometimes. We are struck down, but we know you are there. And Father, let it not be about us, but let it be about your son and that household, that stewardship that you have given us, whether it's in our home, in our family, our work, or as ministers of the church, as elders who are called out to serve a particular purpose. But we are sheep, tired, weak, without power of our own. Grant us that power. Grant us that strength. Help us with that perseverance and let us continue to honor you in all that we do, no matter where we are, what situation we are. And God, we just ask that you will raise up such men amongst us and through your church through all the world who can stand against those difficulties, who can bear up under those challenges through you and through your Son, who is our hope of glory. Amen.